Hello, everyone, and welcome to this UMDF webinar. Um, today, we're very excited to be joined by Dr. Peter Stackpole from the University of Florida Colorado College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Stackpole is going to uh, start out with a presentation where he's going to tell us a little bit about a, a phase three trial, clinical trial for dichloroacetate, which is an investigational new drug, uh, and specifically, uh, the utility of it for the treatment of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex or PDC deficiency. Um, after Dr. Dr. Stackpole's presentation, we're going to have a question and an answer period. So we ask uh, that you submit your questions through the chat box. We'll be keeping an eye on that. We'll try to find the questions that are of greatest interest. Please understand interest of time and hitting the most important points. We may not be able to answer all questions, but please do uh, submit them and uh, we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. So with that, um, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Stackpole, who's going to walk us through uh, some of the background on this trial and some of the plans. Dr. Stackpole. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, and I appreciate the opportunity that's provided by the UMDF to talk to you today uh, about this uh, phase three clinical trial of DCA in pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency, which is really a partnership. It involves support from the Orphan Products Division of the Food and Drug Administration, from the National Institute for Child Health and Development at NIH, and from two biotech companies that have been helpful in terms of uh, designing and, and really implementing this trial, and that is Metazone Biotech and Sale Therapeutics. Now the next slide, please. Before we talk about the trial itself, I just wanted to make sure that everyone has an understanding about how DCA works and why it might be useful in PDC deficiency. On the left-hand side of this slide, you can see glucose, which really is a function of the carbohydrates that we take in our diet every day or manufacture by our liver. And on the, the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a, uh, something called ATP, which is the major energy source for all our cells. ATP is the energy molecule that allows all our cells, no matter what they are, to do the functions that they're supposed to do, whether it's a kidney cell or a muscle cell or a brain cell. So if we go back to the left-hand side of the slide, we can see that glucose or carbohydrates are metabolized through a process in the cytoplasm of the cell called glycolysis. And that forms pyruvate, which can also be converted to lactate. Now, lactate, of course, is very important, particularly in children with PDC deficiency. But under normal circumstances, pyruvate enters the mitochondria and is acted on by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, shown as PDC. And what PDC does is unique. It converts the pyruvate, which is ultimately derived from the carbohydrate fuels that we consume to a molecule called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA then enters a process of degradation through what's called the tricarboxylic acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and ultimately through the various complexes of the respiratory chain to generate that high energy phosphate called ATP. Now under normal circumstances, sometimes cells want more or less activity of the PDC. And that is regulated predominantly by changes in the amount of phosphate that is added to the enzyme. And the phosphate is added by pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, PDK, in the diagram. That inhibits the enzyme activity. On the other hand, there is a pyruvate dehydrogenase phosphatase, PDP, that removes a phosphate group and restores normal enzymatic activity. Now what DCA does is to inhibit PDK and therefore prevents phosphorylation and maintains PDC in its maximally active form. Now children born with loss of function mutations in PDC aren't known to have any abnormalities in PDK or PDP. However, even though children may be significantly affected by those mutations, we know that they must have some residual PDC activity in their cells in order to survive, in order to grow and develop. We believe 
that by inhibiting PDK with DCA, we can lock PDC, whatever amount is residual in the cells of these children, in its active form and facilitate as much as possible the conversion of substrate fuels like carbohydrates into energy as ATP. And we can also reduce the chance for those children to develop lactic acidosis, which is a common serious side effect of PDC deficiency because pyruvate can be oxidized by PDC rather than being converted to lactic acid. Next slide, please. So what is a phase three trial? You've all heard of different types of phase one, two, three, and even four phases of trials. The phase three trial is really the ultimate test of an investigational drug's safety and efficacy. It goes through many years prior to that of preclinical studies in animals and in cells, and then phase one and two trials, which give a hint as to the safety and efficacy. But the ultimate test is the phase three trial, and the FDA must approve the clinical protocol for a phase three trial, in other words, its study design, and also approve what the primary clinical endpoints of that trial are. If the results are positive, the sponsor of that trial can then submit a new drug application to the Food and Drug Administration for approval of the drug for the specified condition, and that is our primary goal in conducting this phase three trial. As you know, there are no FDA-approved therapies for primary mitochondrial diseases, and that includes PDC deficiency. Next slide, please. So who is eligible for this study? We are going to be recruiting up to 30 patients with PDC deficiency. And at the time of their entry into the trial, they must be either at least six months old, but no older than 17 years and 11 months. They should have a clinical and or biochemical phenotype that is consistent with PDCD. That means they may have problems with uh, normal intellectual development, normal physical development, muscle weakness, seizures, a number of different types of, of clinical phenotypes, and they will often have elevations of lactate in their blood. But the most important criterion is that we must have proof of a pathological mutation in one of the genes associated with PDC. If a child has a known pathological mutation, which means that the mutation that child has has already been published in the scientific literature and has been associated with clinical symptoms, then that child can be eligible. If a child, however, has a novel mutation, in other words, one that's never been reported before, then we must make sure that that mutation is pathological and is associated with a decrease in enzyme activity. Therefore, for those novel mutations, proof of pathological uh, mutation is associated, has to be associated with a decrease in enzymological activity in cells, either white blood cells, fibroblasts, or other types of cells from the patient. And those studies can be conducted by the diagnostic core for our trial, which is situated at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Next slide, please. Now, how is our trial designed? As I've mentioned, there's no FDA-approved therapies for PDC deficiency, so the FDA requires that we compare the safety and efficacy of DCA to a placebo. The study is a double-blind crossover comparison, therefore, of oral DCA plus standard of care to placebo plus standard of care that is relevant to that particular patient. The placebo phase and the DCA phase are each four months in duration, and all patients will receive DCA. But because the trial is randomized, that means much like the toss of a coin, a given person may receive DCA first or may receive placebo first. That's the randomization. Double blind means that neither the family of the patient or the patient and the caregivers, meaning the nurse coordinator involved in the trial, or the physicians that are directly involved in the care of the patient are blinded as to which treatment is being given to the patient at any particular time. That's what double blinding means. Next slide, please. So this is a summary of how we have uh, designed this trial. After a patient is screened and found to be eligible based on clinical and biochemical criteria, 
Then the patient has a small buccal swab, in other words, a cheek, an inner cheek uh, swab of cells that is taken to a lab to genotype that patient. We know that the enzyme that's called GSTZ1 is the enzyme that metabolizes DCA. And we also know that some people metabolize DCA faster than others. After patients are studied and, and the families become familiar with our uh, survey, then they are divided into either fast metabolizers of DCA, which we call EGT carriers, or slow metabolizers of DCA, who are non-carriers of EGT. And based on that, the drug is given at a dose that's twice as high as fast with fast metabolizers as compared to slow metabolizers. The same effect is the same, uh, but because of the change in rate of metabolism, more drug is given to fast metabolizers. And then after the double-blind period where a patient receives DCA and placebo, patients are then encouraged to go on open-label DCA for an indefinite period of time where we can evaluate the long-term effects of DCA on the children. Next slide, please. So what are our trial's primary endpoints? ones that have been established with collaboration with the FDA. The first is safety. We want to make sure that DCA is well tolerated and non-toxic. And helping that is a group called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, which is made up of experts of mitochondrial disease, of statistics, of ethics, and of DCA. And these individuals are empowered to break the blind. In other words, to know at any given time whether a patient is receiving DCA or placebo, if they feel that a child's health and welfare is important to know what treatment they're on at that given time. So there's always this overview of the DSMB in ensuring maximum safety uh, of the drug during this phase three trial. So the next endpoint is efficacy. We want to show that DCA improves the functionality of the child while at home. And so we have worked with the FDA over, over a year in developing a novel, first of a kind in mitochondrial diseases, observer reported outcome questionnaire as the primary efficacy endpoint. And this is a questionnaire that was developed by contacting families throughout the United States and asking them, what do you see when your child is ill at home? And based upon those responses, we developed this questionnaire that takes only about three or four minutes to complete, but that must be completed by a parent of a child participating in the study at the end of every day during the double blind period. This information is so critical that Without it, we would not be able to have a successful trial. And so it is a great partnership between us, the investigators and the physicians and families of children with PTC deficiency to work together in ensuring that the efficacy of BCA is appropriately evaluated. Next slide, please. These are some of the basic elements of the uh, survey, the questionnaire that we've developed. And they have to do with motor function, with breathing, with seizures, whether a child has seizures or not, and how many there are, if the child has any eating difficulties, fatigue, sleep, and general health. And again, these are filled out at the end of every day by a family member and then uploaded electronically to our data coordinating center, which collects all this information. And every day that a child is in the double blind phase, this questionnaire must be completed and filled out. Thank you. Next slide. There are nine participating clinical centers involved in this phase three trial. Going from west to east, they are at the University of Washington, at Stanford University, and at Children's Hospital of Orange County. It includes the University of Utah in Salt Lake, Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, the University of Pittsburgh, and along the eastern uh, coast, Gainesville, the University of Washington, uh, University of uh, Florida, uh, 
in Washington, D.C., Children's National Medical Center, and Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to address any questions or comments. Next slide. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stackpole. Um, really exciting to, to see this, uh, well, this research reach this stage. I, I know this is something you've worked on for, for, for many years to, to, to get to this point and a lot of determination from your side to, uh, to make it happen. And uh, from the community, we, we thank you for your, your commitment to trying to develop treatments and cures for mitochondrial disease patients, particularly to PDCD patients. Um, uh, just a reminder to everyone that uh, the uh, chat box can be used for any questions that you may like us to pose to Dr. Stackpole. Um, maybe while we get those together, I'm just going to kind of start with a, you know, a general one. You mentioned this observer reported outcome. And, you know, I think this is such a fundamental part, right, of this cl clinical trial design and really a testament to the importance of the patient voice, right, in clinical research. Um, th this is meant to involve uh, the observer or the parent or the guardian at this point, you know, in the collection of data upon which a regulatory decision will be made. Um, so um, maybe just talk a little bit about this. I mean, another aspect of it, of course, is I'm really pleased that UMDF, uh, through a grant, was able to fund some of the development of this observer reported outcome. Maybe, maybe talk a little bit about how you've uh, reached the point now where this is a validated uh, endpoint for use in a, in a clinical trial. Sure, you're right. It is very unique and uh, you're also right, Phil that uh, part of the uh, testing and uh, validation of this was made possible through a grant from the UNVF. When we first talked to the uh, FDA about conducting a phase three trial, we realized, as the FDA did, that there were no validated biochemical biomarkers that could be used to assess efficacy because mm -hmm. lactate levels, for example, are so variable and unpredictable in a given patient. So, uh, in talking with the FDA, we decided that we would try to develop a mechanism by which we would really empower the families and the guardians of these patients to take an active and primary role. In fact, uh, in developing this survey, we then have made the families the, the major responsible investigators, if you will, mm -hmm. for conducting uh, this primary efficacy outcome measure. Without their cooperation, without the compliance of the families in completing this form every day, then we will not be able to uh, provide the FDA with the necessary information to allow them to determine whether DCA should be approved as a treatment for PDC deficiency. So this is a major commitment uh, by the families, and I, it's very important that they understand how critical this is to uh, developing a successful clinical trial. Yeah, I mean, this is a great example of the, you know, the patients and patient community are, are equal partners in, in this research and the success of it will depend upon their uh, participation in it and, and doing it in a way that meets the needs, right, of the protocol for, for the FDA to make a de decision. Uh, but I, I think it, 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 it's empowering in a way, right, you know, for, for the patient community to know that, uh, that they can play an active role in this. It's not just a passive uh, participation in it. Um, some of the, the timelines, I know you, you gave uh, the, the treatment period in that, but it, in terms of reporting back to the community, um, you know, the, there's a lot we could talk about, about, you know, once an NDA is filed and what that triggers and the amount of time at the FDA, but in general, but just to help set the expectations of the community, when might they expect to begin to hear some results of this after the trial is complete? Well, the pandemic sort of set us back a long way. So we had to develop ways to remotely consent uh, patients and families. Uh, we anticipate enrolling at least uh, 30 patients. We have, uh, in, we're on the process now of enrolling uh, 12 of those individuals at the present time at the various uh, centers that I pointed out in the, in the map. My guess is that uh, we would not be able to finish the double blind part of the trial until sometime in 2022. Hmm. 
And at that point, uh, we will, even though patients may be continuing on open label DCA, the, the basic crux of the uh, primary outcomes that will determine whether the FDA approves or not approves this, uh, this trial's uh, results is based on the double blind phase. So we anticipate that we might be able to analyze the data and have that information submitted to the FDA sometime in 2022, perhaps toward the end of that year. Okay, so it, it may even push into 2023 before we have a, a, a decision from the FDA. It's, right. Yeah, usually for situations like this, when there is a, a rare disease, a rare pediatric mm -hmm. disease, um, the FDA tends to take a fairly flexible and uh, an active role. And uh, uh, I would anticipate that once the, the NDA is submitted, if we do submit an NDA, then we would have uh, some sort of response by the FDA within six months. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a complex process and um, sometimes it's hurry up and wait, but um, it's, it's part of uh, our system of checks and balances, right, to make sure that the data are supporting uh, the regulatory decision that the FDA takes. So I think we have to appreciate that too. So you, you mentioned about um, uh, recruitment and you showed the, the sites. Uh, for, for those listening um, that may be interested in this, that may not be close to one of the sites, is remote recruitment a possibility through a local healthcare provider? It absolutely provider? is. Thank you for raising that uh, point. It absolutely is, and we, we owe it to the uh, support of Sale Therapeutics to have worked with NORD, the National Organization for Rare Disorders, to create a plan whereby uh, there is free transportation, air uh, transportation, by a patient uh, and a parent to and from the particular site that is closest to them geographically, uh, as well as ground transportation and overnight uh, hotel stays to engage in approximately five on-site visits to a particular study site. So over the course of, a, of the double-blind period, there will be approximately five on-site visits that last only uh, part of a day. But the transportation is covered uh, through the contract with Nord. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fantastic. So that's really important for the patient community to be aware of that you, know, you don't have to be physically within driving distance or close to one of these sites that there are, there are provisions that would cover the costs associated with travel uh, you know, to, to the sites. Ultimately, though, the patients will need to travel to the sites, will need to physically visit one of the clinical sites in order to participate in the trial. Right. Right. Um, there was a question posed in chat around side effects uh, for DCA. Anything you can uh, speak to there sure. based on the uh, experience? Sure. We have uh, studied DCA in children with congenital lactic acidosis and a variety of mitochondrial conditions for, for decades. And we have uh, continued to treat many of those children for years on oral DCA at doses uh, similar to what we're proposing for this phase three trial. The only uh, potential dose limiting side effect of DCA that we've seen after decades of experience is, at least in children, an, an asymptomatic, meaning it's not clinically evident to them as, as best we can tell, uh, decrease in nerve conduction velocity in the peripheral nerves of the, of the legs and arms. And we can measure this by various types of standard electrical conduction studies, but even though we have shown that this can happen with long-term use of DCA, we don't see any complications of this. We've treated some children with PDC deficiency for 20 or more years and have them on open label DCA as a result of these earlier clinical trials. And they uh, experience no evidence of, uh, uh, of toxicity, including nerve toxicity. We've also conducted uh, long-term safety studies of children who have been on uh, DCA for many years and there is no evidence of toxicity to the blood, to the liver, to the heart, to the kidneys, or any other tissue in the body. So we think DCA is going to be uh, very safe in this condition, and we're making it even further safe by allocating patients to a particular dose based on how fast or slowly they metabolize DCA. 
Yeah, so a, uh, perhaps you mentioned it, and I, I might have missed it, but um, I, I, assuming that DCA will be administered in pill form, so it will be oral administration. Or, uh, it'll be liquid. Uh, it'll be liquid, uh, so it will be liquid and administered either orally or through a feeding tube. Okay. Yeah, uh, but but not through an injection or, or any other no. means of, uh, of delivery like that, in case anybody was wondering about it. Uh, there was a question posed in chat around um, eligibility based on a, a previously taken biopsy, right, or fibroblasts that, that were grown at the time. Would, would that need to be repeated? Is there some time period where you'd say we want to revisit that, that diagnosis? No. If the, if the uh, data from the biopsy, no matter how many years ago, showed that there was a pathological mutation or showed that there was a novel mutation but was what was associated with a decrease in PDC enzyme activity, that's fine. Those, uh, those data would be acceptable for eligibility to the trial. Excellent. So we're, we're coming up within a few minutes here, uh, the, the end of the, the, the webinar. Um, if, if there are any other questions, please uh, pop them into chat. We'll, we'll, we'll try to get to it before we close. But, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, as you well know, Dr. Stackpole, um, the most common reason that a, a clinical trial fails right, or doesn't result in, in, a, in a positive outcome is not because of safety, not because of efficacy, but because of failure to recruit sufficient patients. And uh, I, I just wondered if, you know, it's easy for me to, to advocate for why the patient community, you know, needs to participate in, in clinical research and, and share and be a part of, uh, of clinical research. But from an investigator's perspective, and in this case, the principal investigator for this trial, uh, you know, I think this is your opportunity to make the pitch right to, to the community of, well, we need you. We can't do this with, without patients. Well, you're absolutely right. That is the rate limiting step for the success of almost any trial, especially phase three trials that are so detailed and involved and are so critical uh, to evaluate a potential, potentially FDA approvable treatment. So we have study coordinators and principal investigators who are experts in PDC deficiency and mitochondrial diseases in general at all these various sites that are participating in this trial. They are fully committed to this trial and we are then fully committed to making sure that any issues regarding potential questions from families about the trial are answered. We can uh, address any concerns that might be uh, in the minds of parents. And really, it is the parents and the guardians of these children who are so critical to us to ensure that we have adequate recruitment of these patients in a finite period of time. We hope to recruit all 30 patients uh, before the end of 2021. That's our goal, and that's why we hope to be able to finish this trial by the end of the following year. Yeah, fantastic, uh, well, well said. Uh, so maybe let's just wrap up with how um, families, parents, guardians that are interested in more information uh, can, can find information. So uh, I'm assuming the trial is already listed on clinicaltrials.gov. It is. Uh, uh, so we can share that specific link uh, after the meeting and by email with all the, uh, the participants. But for those of you that are on the call, clinicaltrials.gov is the place, right, the central repository for all FDA-approved clinical trials. It has a really robust search mechanism, so you could go in and search you know, on keywords like just mitochondrial disease and see all the trials that have some component of mitochondrial disease, or you could be very targeted and specific, something like uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase uh, complex uh, de deficiency and get to the trials focused on that. So uh, from an educational perspective, that's a great great resource for information and that that's where information approved by the FDA always resides. So you know that you're, you're getting the latest. And you can always email me, email me directly. Uh, it's a simple email address, pws at ufl.edu. Right. Well, we'll make sure that that gets passed along as well. Uh, Dr. Stackpole is uh, always great uh, about uh, sharing his time on, on these sorts of things. If you're interested at any level, um, I encourage you, 
research it, um, reach out, make contact, come through UMDF if you want from a support point of view. We're here to help, uh, but ultimately uh, we hope you'll choose to be a, a, a part of this uh, clinical research. Dr. Stackpole, thank you for your time. Thank you for your efforts. And we really look forward to down the road being able to share back with the community the progress that's made with this clinical trial. Thank you very much, Phil, and to the UMDF sure. for this opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody.